So today I want to talk about whether we can stop sinning and if we must stop sinning. Now I know that I've covered this extensively on this channel and I will continue to cover it extensively as long as there are apostate churches out there who are teaching the opposite of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now we hear the same thing preached by the apostles in the New Testament as well. So we're going to get into this. We're going to look at um, John's writings, 1 John and the Gospel of John. So we're going to see what John said and what Jesus said. But first I want to read you a comment that was made nine months ago. I just saw it. That happens, right? With this interface that YouTube has created, it's a disaster for managing comments. It's one of the worst I've ever seen. But that's what we have. And so sometimes some comments slip by that were made on older videos because they don't show up at the top. Usually only the comments on recent videos show up at the top of the comments. And even when I try to sort it uh, using some special tools from TubeBuddy, which is one thing I've got a membership to, and uh, it still doesn't work well. It actually works a little worse when I try to use that. So that's what we have. But this video is called Do Not Give In To Sin, Job 28, 28. And the thumbnail says, give in to sin. And it's about assurance of salvation. This guy's name is Timothy, Timothy Breed. And he says, we walk in spirit. This is, this is typical apostate church preaching. So he's been brainwashed and absorbed this through the teachings in the church, on the radio, in Christian music, all of these places, Christian TV. All these places are preaching the apostate church's gospel, which is not Jesus' gospel. So be careful. Now listen to this, and then I'm going to read my extensive um, comment in response. We walk in spirit, not the spirit, in spirit. We walk in spirit if we are truly born again. Notice it's not born from above, if you remember our series. This is Nicodemus's view, not Jesus's view. Born again is Nicodemus's view, not Jesus's view. Jesus is, is born from above. We walk in spirit if we are truly born again. It's because of our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Why would he say thy to me? He says, our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. It's like, I mean, literally means holy or sacred uh, be your name. He knows us and drew us to him through his only begotten Son, our Savior, Yeshua. So here he has been brainwashed into using magic. And I mentioned this before. The use of Hebrew words, and especially the name of Jesus in Hebrew, if you are a native English speaker and not living in Israel, speaking Hebrew as your language on a daily basis, if you're using those, then it's a form of magic. You have this feeling that there's something special about using it in Hebrew as opposed to any other language, especially your native language. And so you favor using that because you think that there's something special, some power in using it that way. And that is magic. You must stop that or you will end up in the burning lake of sulfur. No matter what else you believe and do, you will end up in the burning lake of sulfur. So, if you're an adulterer, and yet everything else about your life is right on and spot on and what you believe, but you still are an adulterer, you will still end up in the burning lake of sulfur. No matter how strongly, how convinced you are that Jesus is the Savior and the Son of God, you will end up in the burning lake of sulfur. We're not judged based on what we believe. We're judged based on what we do. And Jesus' gospel makes that clear over and over and over again. Not anywhere do we find that we are judged based on what we, what we believe. Now you're going to say, what about John 3? Well, all right, it does say believe, but then it clarifies what that means, and he says that the one who is condemned for not believing in Jesus, he hates the light, refuses to come into it, loves the darkness because his deeds are evil, his actions. The word deeds, works, actions, same word in Greek. His actions are evil. He's chosen to do evil and love evil and therefore hates the light, refuses to come into it. No matter how much he says he believes in Jesus, he doesn't really believe in Jesus because he continues to sin. All right, we'll get into that. All right, so we walk in the Spirit if we are 
truly born again, it's because of our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. He knows us and drew us to him through his only begotten Son, our Savior, Yeshua, a.k.a. Jesus, the Christ, because we truly believe and love him. Okay, now, he says, because we truly believe and love him. How do you know that you truly believe in Jesus? Well, Jesus said, you will not love the darkness and hate the light, and you will not do evil. You will do truth. He didn't say good. He says truth. You will do truth, and you will come into the light so that your actions will be made manifest for what they are, that they are wrought in God. So, you can look up that word, W-R-O-U-G-H-T. It says, because we truly believe and love him. Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commands. It's plural. It's not one command to believe in him. To believe in him is to keep his commands. Uh, not just by believing in him. You believe in him, you will keep his commands. That means everything he taught. So it says, because we truly believe and love him, Okay, so it says that God drew us to God, the Father, through Jesus, because we truly believe and love him. That doesn't make sense to the apostate preaching, because it's not we who deserved it because of something we already believed, and we already loved him, and therefore God drew us to the Father through Jesus. No, that's not what the apostate church preaches. So it preaches that there was absolutely nothing in us, in and of ourselves, that warranted being saved. And yet God called, and if we respond, if we responded to God's call at that point, then he saves us. So he almost had it right. The drawing, the calling, literally not drawing, calling comes first. All right, so let's keep going. We are all sinners. Well, how can we say we love Christ if we are sinners? We cannot, because Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commands. If you keep his commands, you're not a sinner. What? How are you sinning if you're keeping Christ's commands? You can't keep them partially and say that you love him. He says, if you love me, you will keep my commands. He doesn't make any sort of compromise with you. In fact, the ones who wanted to compromise, he says, you're not worthy to follow me. One said, well, let me go back and plow my, i got a field, I've got to get it plowed first, and then I can leave it and let it go, and we can go. He says, whoever puts his hand to the plow is not worthy to follow me. One man said, my father died. I've got to go to the funeral, and then I'm ready to go. His father died, and Jesus said, let the dead bury the dead. So if you go back to bury your father, you are dead. That's what he's saying. Do not follow me. You can't follow me. It's done. You'll never be able to follow me. You're dead. That's harsh. But that's what Jesus said. There was no compromise. There was no partially following Jesus. It was all or nothing to the rich young ruler. Sell everything you have and give it away to the poor so you don't have a penny of it. Then come follow me. He didn't compromise with the rich young ruler. Oh, you can keep this much money for food. No, he didn't. He said, sell everything and give to the poor and then come follow me. There was no compromise. We are all sinners, he says, Timothy. We are all sinners. We. We are all sinners, he is saying. He is admitting that he is a sinner. Still a sinner. Not previously, still a sinner. We are all sinners Truly disgusting. He thinks everyone is truly disgusting. That's what he says, including himself. He's claiming that Paul said that. I know what he's talking about, and that's not what it says. And Paul is quoting the Old Testament. And it's not what it means in the Old Testament either. No one... He misspells no to K-N-O-W. It means N-O. No one deserves to be saved. But he just said, 
that God saved us because we believed and loved Christ first. But that's not what 1 John says. He says, we love him because he first loved us. Christ first loved us. No one deserves to be saved lest, now he's using King James, <laughs> old English that we never ever use today, unless we're quoting the King James, and this is not quoting the King James. No one deserves to be saved lest no one can boast. What? He's piecing things together that aren't there in the scriptures together. Okay? No one deserves to be saved lest no one can boast. It is a free gift from our Father. Okay? Well, first off, I have to debate who his Father is if he is a sinner and truly disgusting and has not stopped sinning. John says in 1 John that his Father is the devil. He has never known Christ. That's what John says. The one who, who continues to sin has never known Christ. And his father is the devil, because the devil's been sinning since the beginning. And that's what he's saying about himself. He's been sinning since the beginning, since he was born, and still is sinning, even after, even after he believes that he was saved through Christ out of the world. And yet he still is sinning in a way that's truly disgusting. He says so. I know where he's trying to take this from a second, Ephesians 2, sorry, stomach, Ephesians 2, 8 through 9, as they like to truncate the passage, it's 8 through 10, and when you truncate it with 9, you think that anything and everything that we do is, is something that causes us to boast, and therefore we cannot do anything that is worthy of, of God. And yet verse 10 says we can, that God created us for good works. He custom fitted us to good works, and it's called good works there, as opposed to just works in verse 9, because the works in verse 9 are our works that we think up, that we think we should do, no matter how religious it is, no matter how good it may sound. We thought up what we should do, and we're doing that. Those are just works by which we might boast. But verse 10 talks about good works for which we were created by God in Christ Jesus to walk all about in. We're, and it actually says custom fitted for those good works. We are custom fitted. Not the good works are custom fitted to us. We are custom fitted to those good works to walk all about in them. All right, so... And he also doesn't understand the different stages of salvation. And he's talking about salvation uh, confusing the different stages from being saved out of the whole collection of individuals called the world and being saved from sin, from actually doing sin, which is, and we are to walk in that. Walk without doing sin and by doing what is equitable. That is the second salvation. And the third salvation is the final judgment where we are rewarded with eternal life. And we won't make it through the third one if we don't make it through the second one. We don't make it through the second one unless we've made it through the first one. They're all together one, just like the Trinity is one. The Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are each one God, and yet there's only one God. And the same with our salvation. There are three salvations, and yet there's only one salvation. All right, so let's keep going. There is nothing under the sun that can be or has been done that can save except what our Savior Jesus has already done for us on the tree he was nailed to. Okay, so he's taking this nothing under the sun from Ecclesiastes, which has nothing to do with Jesus, and he's pulling it out here. There is nothing under the sun that can be or has been done that can save except but that's not true that's not true here's the problem is it what about all the people in the old testament who will be saved before christ died on the so-called tree what about that how are they saved 
Christ hadn't died yet. So what about that? So he, he's not being sober about the scriptures, the testimony of God. Because the Old Testament was the only testimony of God. At the time of Jesus, in his ministry and the early church, it was the only testimony of God. There were no books to the New Testament. There were no letters written yet for the New Testament. There wasn't any content for the New Testament. It was the Old Testament writings, which were the testimony of God, the scriptures. And so, what about the people in the Old Testament times? How are they saved since Christ hadn't died yet? Okay. So, yeah, he's not right. Also, Paul writes in Romans 10, how can someone be saved if they haven't heard? And how can they hear if no one preaches to them? And how can someone preach if they haven't been sent? There are a lot of actions that are involved by other people, including yourself, that are required for you to be saved. It's not only about Jesus dying on the cross. And you say, Ron, how dare you? Who sent him to die on the cross? We volunteered. Not exactly. The Father sent him to die on the cross. You think the Father and the Holy Spirit had nothing to do with it? It wasn't just about Jesus and just about him by himself dying on a cross. Otherwise, we're still in our sins and we will not be resurrected. Because Jesus didn't resurrect himself. God raised him from among the dead ones. God, the Father, raised him from among the dead ones. And actually, it's not raised, it's woke up. Okay? Or stood up. Anastasia stood up. And he woke him from among the dead ones and stood him up. So, it's not Jesus all by himself. You also have the Father involved and you have the Holy Spirit involved. And you have, then, for the salvation of individual human beings, for that to be applied to them, you have the church sending preachers who go and preach to the people and the people responding and, and doing something in their hearts with their mouths. It's not only Jesus. Jesus has a body that he left on earth in the place of his body that was ascended to heaven. That body was formed on Pentecost. When the Holy Spirit came into that body and brought it to life. The same way that he raised from the dead, from the grave. When the Holy Spirit came in and, and raised him from the dead, from the grave. When the Spirit goes into the body, the Spirit means breath also, literally breath, is the same word as spirit, pneuma. So, spirit, breath, air, they're all the same word. So, when he... The Holy Spirit raised Jesus from the dead. The same way where the Holy Spirit came into the body of Christ, the church, and gave it life at Pentecost. And so now we are the body. We are physically, literally, the body of Christ on the earth. That's why we must do the ministry of Christ. Otherwise, we have no connection to the head who is Christ in heaven at the right hand of God who is the head of the body. He's the one who is telling the body what to do. He's the one who's guiding the body, controlling the body and the parts of the body to do the ministry. And if you aren't doing the ministry of Christ on earth, you are not part of his body. Okay. So it's not only about what Jesus did on the cross. That's a very Protestant view. But it's unbiblical. It's completely unbiblical. It's not a lone ranger, even with Jesus. Jesus was not a lone ranger. He was not all, all off by himself and did everything by himself without any connection to God the Father or any connection to God the Holy Spirit or any connection later to the church through the Holy Spirit on earth choosing and sending people to preach his gospel to individuals and the individuals themselves coming to life, believing, and confessing. No, Jesus was not all by himself, and he never claimed to be. In fact, he claims the opposite. 
And when you read the Bible that way, then you've got a solid foundation for what's being said. But when you read it as an American Christian who thinks that everyone has equal authority because of the idea of democracy, this wicked, wicked, wicked idea that came out of the Great Rebellion, and that we can be pioneers all off by ourselves. Even the pioneers weren't off by themselves. They went off in groups of families together for protection against the Indians as they traveled across the plains. And when they settled, they didn't just settle off in a cabin up in the mountains. Those were the mountain men. Those were the men who were so uncouth they couldn't be around other people because the other people couldn't stand them. They were isolated incidents. But the people in general, the pioneers, they founded the towns in order to have protection. They brought out men who, who could defend them as well against criminals and Indians. There was no one who was isolated off on their own as a pioneer. So this concept of being a pioneer and I can do it all by myself and rough it and, and I'm right and I can't trust that anyone else is right. That's paranoia. That's what brought down the Roman Empire when they were drinking out of lead dishes. They went cuckoo. And now we're seeing it in America. It's rabid. It's the most rabid mental illness among most Americans. Is this paranoia of authority. Terrible. It's awful. Jesus was not like that, and he's not calling us to be like that. He's calling us to be dependent on each other and to trust the Holy Spirit in each other and among us. He's not leaving us without the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is here. Watch my 300 plus videos. Tell me that you don't sense the Holy Spirit in the teaching. That you don't sense the Holy Spirit in me through the authority that Christ gave me in the church. If you're connected to Christ, you feel that. You sense that. You know it. And I'm not the only one. There are plenty of other teachers out there who also are trying to stay connected to Christ, listening to the Holy Spirit, exercising that authority that they've been given as leaders in the church in order for your benefit to grow you, make you strong, to give you knowledge, but not for knowledge's sake, not so that you'll understand the puzzles of the Bible. That's worthless. That's garbage. That's trash. If that's your attitude, throw it all out because you're going to be lost. You're not going to be saved in the end. Knowledge is only useful for guiding actions. That's it. So you learn knowledge from the Bible in order to do it. That's why my videos are all about practical things. When we unravel some riddle from a scripture or something, you notice it's all about action, doing, obedience. So take that as a lesson and a template to imitate me. Let's keep going. So then it says, everyone, even after being born again, there's that mistake again, will continue to sin in the flesh. I mean, in the flesh. <laughs> will continue to sin in the flesh because they think that there are two different men in us or women, right? Two different persons in us, that there's the person of the flesh and there's the person of the spirit, and that the person of the spirit believe, believes in Christ and doesn't sin, but the person of the flesh sins, and that the person of the spirit is not held accountable for it. This is the duality of Gnosticism. Gnosticism was already being addressed by John in 1 John. It had already begun to rise up and be a threat to the church, and it lives on today. The strongest um, example of it in recent living memory is the New Age movement. Now, not all the New Age movement w was taking on Christ as a component, but some of them were. The Course in Miracles, for example. And there are plenty of other examples like this, but you also had Norman Vincent Peale's Power of Positive Thinking, which was way back at the beginning of the 20th century. And, and he built the Crystal Cathedral in California very famous place. I think his son now runs it, or maybe his grandson even, I don't know. But anyway, Gnosticism. It says there's a duality 
of the man. There's the flesh, which is the evil part, and there's the spirit, which is the good part. And the good part is what's going to be saved, and the flesh is what's going to be destroyed. But that's not what it says in the Bible. It says our flesh will be raised from the dead. And it'll be clothed with immortality. Incorruptibility, literally. That it cannot be corrupted. It's, it's corruptible right now, like can de decay. But it will be clothed with incorruptibility where it cannot decay. Our flesh, not our spirit, our flesh, our bodies will be raised from the dead, from among the dead ones, like Jesus was, and clothed with this immortality, this uh, inability to decay, as Jesus' body was. So, this duality has no place in the Christian concept. If you sin, you sin. If you're using your body to sin, you're sinning. And it's held against you. Everyone, even after being born again, will continue to sin in the flesh. But through Christ Jesus, Christ is all capitalized, not sure why. But through Christ Jesus, we are set free from the penalty of sin and death in the spirit a.k.a. eternity. He's equating spirit with eternity. Spirit does not mean eternity. There's no equivalence of spirit and eternity in the Bible. In fact, the Bible doesn't mention eternity at all. Hate to burst your bubble, but it doesn't mention eternity. The closest it gets to is the age of the ages. That could be interpreted as eternity. But that's the closest. And most of the places where it, inter where it translates eternal is just aged. That's all it is. It's the adjective for age, like a period of time. It's just aged. So this is going to transform a lot of theology. When we finish our translation and you look at this and you say, hold on, this isn't about eternity right here. This is about something different. It says aged. Because that's literally what it says. Not eternal. Not even, not even ion, Ionis. It's not age of the ages, even. It's just aged, the adjective, singular. All right, but anyway, spirit is not eternal. I mean, the Holy Spirit is eternal, but the Father and the Son are also. Okay? So, but the spirit is not eternity. It's not. It may be eternal. He may be eternal, but he is not eternity. Not only that, we are set free from the penalty of sin and death in the Spirit. No. We're set free from the penalty of sin and death because sin is cleansed from us. It doesn't mean that if we sin again, that we do not have a penalty of sin and death. In fact, there are plenty of passages that say exactly the opposite. The most famous one is Hebrews 6, 4 through 6. So Hebrews 6, 4 through 6. I'll read it to you in the New King James Version. I've got my little Bible right here. My little uh, Gideon Bible from the hotel room. You say, oh, you stole it. No, it actually says that you're free to take these that they will replace those. That they put them there, and you're free to take them if you want. And at the time, I didn't have a physical Bible, and I needed one. So I have this one. You can see it's well-loved. All right, so let's read Hebrews. When was the last time you heard me turning pages? Hebrews chapter 6. It's, for it is impossible, this is 6-4. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened, enlightened, and have tasted the heavenly gift. The heavenly gift. What is the heavenly gift? He said it himself, salvation. And have become partakers of the Holy Spirit. Not only have they tasted the gift of salvation, 
but they've also been partakers of the Holy Spirit. For it is impossible for those and have t- become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God. They've tasted. Now, if you talk to a Christian, they say, well, being born again, what happens is that the Bible becomes like food. When you read it, it's like eating food and you are hungering for more. It's universal, across the board. That's what Christians say, regardless of denomination. When they talk about being born again, they say that is the one unifying feature that you hear. And it's right here. And have tasted the good word of God. Not saying the Bible is the word of God, but the word of God comes through the scriptures and they taste it. Because you can read the Bible before you're born again, born from above, right? I'm using his term born from above, before you're born from above, you can read the Bible and it does. it's not like food at all. It's like a history book or a literature book. But when you're born from above, then you taste something that is behind it. That is the Word of God. That's not the Scriptures. That's the Word of God. And Jesus is the Word of God, remember? In Archaean Hologos, Kaiologos, and Proston, Theon, Kaitheos, and Hologos. In the beginning, in authority was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And in verse 14, he came and tented among us. And goes on about Jesus in the flesh. For it is, um, hold on, to do, to do, to do, and have tasted the good Word of God and the powers of the age to come. And the powers of eternity. They've tasted the powers of eternity. Does this sound like a Christian? Sounds like us. It is impossible for them, it's all described here, if they fall away, if they fall away, to renew them again to repentance. So it says that if they fall away, to renew them again to repentance. Does that sound like you can fall away? Of course it does. It's a condition of what will happen if you do, after having participated in all of that. That if you fall away then, meaning you can, It's impossible to be renewed. It's impossible to renew them. Not be renewed, but to to renew them. It's impossible for us to renew them again to repentance. To a fortitude of mind in the midst of the situation. The exercise of the fortitude of the mind in the midst of the... It's impossible to renew them again to that point. Since they crucify again... For themselves, the Son of God. Who crucified Jesus? It wasn't Christians. Who crucified him? Think about it. It's impossible to renew them to repentance because they crucify Jesus again for themselves and put him to open shame. It doesn't say him, and put to open shame. And that could be putting themselves to open shame. And that's what I believe. Him is not in there, but the New King James and King James inserted in there, and put themselves to open shame by crucifying him again. They put themselves to open shame, which makes it impossible for them to be renewed to repentance again because they've taken a stand against Christ crucifying him so 
So, everyone, even after being born again, will continue to sin in the flesh, but through Christ Jesus we are set free from the penalty of sin and death in the Spirit, a.k.a. eternity. These people were not set free from the penalty of sin and death. They fell away. According to Jesus' preaching, they began loving sin again, evil. And therefore loving darkness and hating light and started refusing to come into the light as they used to be beforehand. That's falling away. Falling away is falling back to how you were before you were saved. Where you hated light. Where you loved darkness. Because you were now doing evil. And you refused to come to the light. So we walk in spirit, he says. And listen to the prompting of the Holy Spirit who guides us 24-7 as we are given power on high to testify about the one who saves, amen, amen, hallelujah, all capitals, Abba, all capitals, amen. He's throwing in everything he can to try to convince you that he knows Jesus Christ and that he's saved, and he's not. And this last statement completely puts the nail in the coffin, or shall we say puts the nail in the cross. He says, so we walk in the Spirit. How can you say you walk in the Spirit if you continually sin? And in a truly disgusting way. He says so. We are all sinners truly disgusting. So we walk in Spirit. So then who is doing the sins of your body? <clears throat> who? Who is that? Are you possessed by a demon? If you're possessed by a demon, you're not saved. So we walk in spirit and listen to the prompting of the Holy Spirit who guides us 24-7. If the Holy Spirit guides you 24-7, then that means you're saying the Holy Spirit guides you to sin. 24-7 means every minute of the day. All the time. Day and night. Every day that the Holy Spirit guides you all the time. If the Holy Spirit guides you all the time, and yet you continue to sin all the time, even a little bit, but you continue to sin and cannot stop sinning, then you are claiming the Holy Spirit guides you to sin. Let's read my... That's, all he, that's what he wrote. He's a fraud. He doesn't know it. He's a fraud. Now, he may have truly been saved from out of the whole collection of individuals, just like all those seeds truly did fall on the ground. And some of them actually sprung up. But not all of them stayed and produced fruit. And you can thank the apostate church for this, for some of this. All right, here we go. His name was Timothy Breed. So I write, Timothy, listen to what you've said. You've said that as long as you are in the body, you will continue to sin. And then the next breath, you claim the Holy Spirit guides you 24-7. So the Holy, the Holy Spirit guides you to sin. It is exactly what you have said. Not only that, that spirit cannot be the Holy Spirit of God. The Greek word for holy means terrifyingly clean. Do you think that God himself and the person of the terrifyingly clean spirit would guide you to sin? Since you are still sinning, you have not been forgiven, according to 1 John 1, 7. That's what John says. Since you are still sinning, you have not been forgiven, according to 1 John 1, 7. Quote, But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, the Son, cleanseth us from all sin. King James Version. Notice that there are two results of the conditional. The if. There are two results from walking in the light. But the condition is that we are walking in the light. 
<laughs> cannot have fellowship with each other if we are walking in darkness. That's what he says. We can't. If we are sinning, we cannot have fellowship together. There is no church. You're not part of the church. That's what it says. That's why Paul said to get rid of the brother who was sinning and, and refused to stop sinning and repent. Neither will the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanse us from all sin if we are not walking in the light. If we walk in the light, the blood of Jesus Christ, the Son, cleanseth us from all sin. There are two results. Now, I know the mental gymnastics the apostate churches put you through to make you think you are walking in both darkness and light at the same time. You are taught that if we believe in Jesus, then that is what it means to walk in the light. No, Jesus himself clarified being in darkness and being in light in John 3. So here's John 3, 18 through 21, King James Version. He that believeth on him, this is Jesus speaking, about himself. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath, not, he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And you say, see, it's about believing. It's not about what we call believing. This is believing in the biblical sense, not in the modern English post-magic era sense, where we think of believing as something that's just part of our imagination, something internal in our head. That's not what believing is in the Bible, and he's going to clarify that right here. And this is the condemnation, and it doesn't say condemnation there. This is the dividing for decision, is what it says. That light is come into the world. This is the thing that divides us for decision about whether we believe in him or not. And this is the dividing for decision. It's literally what the word means. That light is come into the world. That's Jesus. He said, I'm the light of the world. That light is come into the world, and men loved darkness rather than light. Because their deeds, works, actions were evil. It's the same word in Greek. It means deeds, works, and actions, which are basically the same thing. But it's one Greek word. In the Greek, it's one word. And it means all three of those. Because their actions were evil because their actions were evil. They didn't do evil because they loved darkness. They loved darkness because they had chosen to do evil. Verse 20, for everyone that does evil hates the light. There it is, that's the root cause. Everyone who does evil hates the light. And do you think sin is evil? If you don't think sin is evil, then you've got a bigger, deeper problem. Everyone that does evil hates light. Everyone, without exception. That means even people who claim to believe in Jesus. If they do evil, they hate the light. And Jesus said, I am the light of the world. They hate Jesus. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light. They refuse to come to Jesus. They claim that they've come to Jesus. They claim that they're born not from above, again, like Nicodemus wanted to say. They claim that they are a Christian, that they've been saved, that they're converted, that they're going to receive eternal life, but they're not. They refuse to come into the light, and therefore, that dividing by decision has been made. They are divided out from those who will believe, and they are condemned. So it says, neither come to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. He doesn't want to stop doing evil. That's why he doesn't come to the light. It says so right here lest his deeds should be reproved. Because if his deeds are reproved, he has to stop. And he doesn't want to. That's why he doesn't come into the light. That's what Jesus just said. For everyone that does evil hates the light, neither comes to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. Or else his deeds will be re reproved. 
the reason he's not coming to the light is because he does evil and he doesn't want his evil deeds to be reproved, like rebuked, like corrected. He wants to continue to do evil. Verse 21, But he that doeth truth, notice it doesn't say good. The opposite of evil here is truth in this case. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds, his actions, may be made manifest, may be revealed for what it is, that they are wrought in God. To rot is like to work very hard to create something and shape it and make it what it is. Like a sculptor of stone has to have great strength and special tools and patience and work very hard and very carefully to make this what it's going to be. That's what rot means. Here's what I say. Of course, it starts out declaring that the one believing in Jesus is not condemned and the one not believing is condemned already. That's key, already. Then he explains what it means to believe in Jesus. Everyone, without exception, including those who claim to believe in Jesus, who does evil, hates the light. If you do evil, then you hate the light. There are no exceptions. doesn't matter what you say. In this way, you are condemned by God already. Then it says that everyone who does evil refuses to come to the light. And why? But the key is that he is not walking in the light. Because he refuses to even come to the light. Someone who continues to sin is not walking in the light. And therefore, his sins are not cleansed from him. You have no fellowship in the church. We have no fellowship with you. The reason inside him that he refuses to come to light, even if he claims to believe in Jesus, is that his actions are evil. That's what it says. The Greek word for deeds, words, and actions is the same word. In fact, everyone who does evil loves darkness and hates light. Jesus said right there. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Everyone without exception who does evil hates Jesus. It doesn't matter what you say. Your words are not the love. Your actions are. That's the difference between Christian love and the love of the world. The love of the world is this fantasy, these emotions that are evoked by this fantasy. And so that's why when people uh, go to marry someone, they marry someone that they have this fantasy about that evokes certain emotions, and it's a disaster. <clears throat> you might be able to make it that work, but it's very difficult and very improbable. But if it's Christian love, which is all focused on action, then that love is demonstrated and practical, and it has something tangible that is proof of it. It's not something that's imaginary, empty, and useless. Okay, so then I quote where it says about Jesus is the light of the world, John 8. Verse 12, Then spake Jesus unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. So everything Jesus said about light is him. It's about him. The person refuses to come to Jesus, to the light, because his deeds are evil. Whether he says he believes in Jesus or not, he doesn't come to Jesus in actuality. It says, Then, Je then spake Jesus unto them, saying, I am the light of the world, he that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. The Pharisees therefore said unto him, Thou bearest record of thyself, thy record is not true. You are a liar. The Pharisees called Jesus a liar. You're claiming this, but it's not true because you're a liar. Now let's look at this a minute, because the apostate church plays games with this as well. 
and they do these mental gymnastics. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Okay, so followeth me, they then interpret that to mean, they switch it out to mean that, oh, if I continue to, to give mental assent that Jesus is the Son of God, no matter what I do with my body, then I'm following him. And I'm not walking in darkness because inside I believe in God. I believe in Jesus. I believe he's the Son of God. So I'm not walking in darkness. I have the light of life. Walking in dark darkness is physical. It's physical. It's actions. It's not about your mental ascent. It's not about what you think in your head. It's not about what you feel in your heart emotionally. I feel so positive about Jesus. I don't hate him in my heart. No, that's not what it's about. It says walk. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness. Shall not walk in darkness. So let's have a look at this verse here a minute. Okay. And it says, hmm. He who and it's he who is in the same road as me. That's what it is. It's not follow because it doesn't have anything about leading, the verb leading, ago. So yeah, and, and the verb. Uh, walk is you may not walk. You may not walk in darkness and shady obscurity. That's the word darkness, translated darkness, shady obscurity. Okay? So, yeah. You may not, you're not allowed to walk in darkness if you are in the same road as Christ. Why is that? Did Christ walk in darkness? Did Christ sin? Absolutely not. And if you're in the same road as Christ, you, you, mu you may not sin. You're not allowed to sin. Not allowed to. You may not sin. So let's go on with, with the rest of the comment here. So no notice it says, um, He that is in the same road as me may not walk is not allowed to walk, uh, walk about, is peripateo, not just walk, is walk about, may not walk about in darkness, not allowed to, but shall have the light of life. Let's keep going. So then I say, on the other side though, he who does truth comes to the light in order for his actions to be revealed and shown for what they are, wrought in God. They are actions that are done with great fortitude in God. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10 bears this distinction of two kinds of actions out. Verse 10 refers to the actions of the one whose actions are wrought in God, for they are called their good deeds, good works, or good actions, and Jesus declared God alone is good. We know that actions wrought in God are good and of the truth. When you do truth, you do what Jesus did. That is why Jesus himself declared in John 14, verse 6, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way. So if you're in the same way as Jesus, you're in Jesus. I am the way. The way. The truth and the life and if you do truth you are doing what Jesus did because Jesus said I am the truth and by doing that you are on the same road as him following him and you have life if not then you don't have life you don't because Jesus is the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. You cannot come to the Father if you are not on that same road as Christ, which is Christ himself. If you are not doing truth, which is doing what Christ did, because Christ is the truth. 
If you are doing evil, if you are walking in darkness, if you are sinning, you have no part with either the Son or the Father. And John says that in 1 John as well. If you have the Son, you have the Father. If you do not have the Son, you do not have the Father. He is the way, and He calls us to take up our cross and follow Him. We are to take on the will of the Father, just as Jesus did, and do what pleases God. If we do not, then we do not truth. And neither do we come to Jesus, the light. In fact, if we do not do this, then we hate Jesus, the light. Jesus said that. They hate the light. And Jesus said, I am the light. They hate the light. And Jesus said, I am the light. May the Lord bless you as you seek him with all your heart. Remember to subscribe down below and like the video and share it on your Facebook and other social media. And then make a comment, whether a question or a comment. We read all of them and we try to respond to all. Get on over to our website, The Rooted Word, and start reading the translation and also the articles we've posted. It's at therootedword.com, therootedword.com. And may the Lord bless you as you seek Him with all your heart.